Hey, what's going on? Hayden Crabtree here. And today's video, we're going to be talking about how to analyze a self storage investment. I've also put together a checklist for you to make sure that you don't miss any of these moving pieces. So I'm just on LoopNet here looking at deals that are on the market. I'm not a huge fan of on market deals, but we're going to go through one of these just for the purposes of underwriting this. So I picked this deal right here, uh, which gave me this listing. There's not a ton of details here, but there's enough to go through it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into my property stats, which is the software that I created to analyze deals. It it's really good at analyzing self storage deals, multifamily deals, houses, really all kind of real estate investments for long term cash flow. And so if you log into my property stats, you're just going to go to analyze new deal. And we're going to crack down and get started. So I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller here. And we're going to type this in. So we have this Shelbyville, Tennessee deal. And I'm just going to type that in right here uh, Shelbyville deal. And so let's start and let's go through our, our checklist here. Okay, checklist to this uh, will be accompanied in this video. I'm not sure how I'm going to give it to you, but I'll make sure you have the link to this. All you have to do is come to file and then you have to make a copy so that you can go through and you can actually click in and out of these checklists uh, yourself. Okay, so let's get started here. The first place that we're going to enter is the purchase price, which this deal uh, they're asking $3.3 million. Okay. So $3.3 million, we're going to type that in the purchase price here. And then what we have to do is we have to come through and tell the system how will the property be valued. It's a commercial deal, so we're going to do a cap rate. Okay, now next piece up in the checklist, we're going to need to know your cap rate. So what are market rate cap rates? You would have to go out, you'd have to research that. And you can really find that out by seeing other properties that are for sale uh, in similar size markets and knowing that, hey, this cap rate is going to be applicable to this type of property. So just being in the market, you're going to know that. If you don't, you can call big brokers like CBRE, Jones Lang LaSalle, call JLL, Marcus Millichap, and ask about cap rates in your area. And then the rule for me, and really the rule for all commercial real estate investors should be your cap rate plus 1% is what you should underwrite to, okay? And so I know for deals like this one, the cap rate, a fair cap rate is probably six and a half of what you could buy today. So that means my future valuation cap rate, I'm going to use a seven and a half. Okay. That's a six and a half plus 1% to seven and a half. And so you're going to enter your cap rate in there. So step one, the checklist, know your cap rate, put it in done. Now, next up, what we're going to do is we're going to come to our loan assumptions here. Okay. So we can see our loan assumption is 75% LTV, uh, which is 2.4 million at a 5% interest rate. I know that I can probably do a little bit better than this. And that's just because I stay up to date with my lenders. And so I'm going to put in an 80% LTV over 20 years, that's 240 months. And my interest rate that I can get today is probably about 4%. Okay, so I just inputted my loan assumptions in the loan information section. The next piece up is to input my payment penalties. And we can see here that my payment penalties already inputted at a 54321, which I think is pretty good. Um, I think that's probably pretty fair of what you're going to get in most commercial real estate. You may run into a 321, uh, which would be 3%, 2%, 1%, and no year 4 or 5. But I'm going to leave a 54321 in there. And I'm also going to put in that I'm going to pay a half a point. Okay. So we're going to come in. And that means on this loan, I'm going to pay a fee of a half of this loan uh, to the lender at upfront. So other than that, we're good to go. We've inputted our loan information in. So I'm going to come through and I'm going to check this off. Uh, and we also did our prepayment penalties. Now, the next thing that I'm going to go to is the uh, closing costs. And so closing costs in here, I'm not going to get too granular. You could research this. You could go to, uh, I think it's smartasset.com. They'll come up with a detailed list for you. Uh, but I'm just going to go in. I'm going to say it's 1% of the purchase price. is probably how much my closing costs are going to be, which is going to be $33,000. Okay. So you can just ballpark it like that, or you can get more granular. It's really hard to know when you're first analyzing a deal exactly what the closing costs are going to be. But that's probably a pretty good place for me to be. Okay, so I've done that. So let's go check that off the list. Now let's talk about what improvements are needed. So as I look at this property, uh, I'm going to try and figure out what improvements it needs. And so as I look at it, it looks like it has a gate on there. Um, so that's fine. I always want to make sure my properties have gates. If you don't have a gate on your facility, a gate is probably going to cost you about $25,000. Okay, so $25,000 if I didn't have a gate. Now, uh, let's say that I thought this, I don't know why it's not letting me go here. Uh, I might want to get a new sign. A sign is probably going to cost me $7,500 to $10,000. So let's go new sign, okay? I'm going to add in a new sign here. And a new sign. Let's put in $10,000. Okay? $10,000. Uh, let's keep looking through the pictures. They have what looks like some old stuff that's not painted. Looks like there's potentially... 
uh, different colors of paint. If I wanted to do an all new paint job, I would roughly estimate a new paint job is going to cost, you know, I'm talking in 2021 is when this video is being recorded. It's probably going to cost me maybe 75 cents a square foot, okay? And so if I want to do that, I could come in and I could say new paint and I could type in and I could do the math myself or I could do a cost type method, number of square feet, and I could say this is going to be 75 cents a square foot and this building, let's see how many square feet this is. I think it's 56,000. Uh, 56,000 square feet. Okay, so I can enter in here 56,000 square feet, and then my system is going to know 56,000 square feet times 75 cents a square foot is going to come out to $42,000. That's probably a pretty, pretty fair place to be uh, for labor and materials on that. Okay, so let's say that that's all the improvements that we need on this deal. Uh, if we needed cameras, it would be dependent. The camera system is probably going to cost you between ten or twenty thousand dollars, which I don't think I saw any cameras. Uh, on this building actually there's one right there so let's see if they have good camera coverage and these are things when you're visiting and finding out more about the properties that you can find out right but you can sometimes tell from the pictures um, looks like they have some paved other gravel areas if you want to do um, all blacktop or if you want to do concrete on the whole thing you could add that in there as well uh, if there are any repairs needed like if any of your doors are broken I'd probably budget like a thousand dollars a door materials and labor to have it repaired um, but overall, it looks like it's in pretty good shape, right? So let's keep going here. And uh, our next step up in our checklist is going to be operating capital. So operating capital is the money you need sitting in that business's bank account to pay for expenses while you wait for rent to come in, things of that nature. And so you can come to the working capital section of my property stats and you can select what areas uh, you want th this to be calculated off of. Now, what I personally do is I take two months of all expenses and that's how I calculate my operating capital. And so if you check all your expenses here and you just type in how many months do you want in reserve, you can just type in two months here and it'll calculate it for you. Okay, now we haven't entered our expenses in yet, so this number will go up as we change it. All of this is dynamic. And if you haven't signed up for My Property Stats, it's pretty easy. Here's how you do it. You just come to uh, mypropertystats.com and then you hit register now and you can sign up. $99 a year, super cheap. Um, so after we do our operating capital, that's done. Let's talk about our prorations at closing. So in this bottom section here, uh, we know that we're going to have to prorate property taxes, and we're also going to have rent prorations, and if there's any prepaid rent at the facility, those are going to be coming to us. So uh, as we go through and enter in our property taxes, we'll come back to that one. But let's say we knew that we were buying a facility halfway through the month, and let's say they were doing you know $40,000 a month in income. We would be getting $20,000 of that money coming to us based off of if we bought halfway through the month, right? If we bought three-fourths of the way through the month, then 75% of that money would go towards the uh, the prior owner and 25% would go towards us, so we'd only be getting 10000 But let's say we're buying it halfway through the month. We type in negative $20,000. That's the money that would come to us, and watch it reduce our down payment right here. So that went from seven ninety to seven seventy. dollars reduce the amount of investment we're going to have to put in this deal, okay? Now, after we've done that, let's go to our next section, which is research your market rate rents, okay? So really, we have to come through and we have to figure out um, the, the sizes, the rent roll of this facility. And so this facility is under contract. I don't have the rent roll, but I would reach out to Phil here. I would ask him for a rent roll, uh, and I would try and figure out all the different sizes that they had and the rates that they were charging. And so how you input that in the My Property Stats, you come to Income, and you can type in all the different unit sizes. So we'll have a 5 by 10s I'm sure they have 10 by 10s I'm sure they have 10 by 15s and oops. 10 by 15, and I'm sure they have 10 by 20s, okay? So 10 by 20, and I also think I saw they had some bigger industrial units. 20 by 25s, okay? So 20 by 25s, 20x25, okay? And now we can enter our square feet in here, which is 50. I'm just multiplying the sizes here. 100, 150, 200, and I think 20 by 25 is 500 square feet so 500 square feet okay now we can come through and again if you if I had the rent roll I would be putting that in there I'm just kind of spitballing right now for you guys uh, 59 units which is 29,500 square feet um, and so how many total units do they have here they have 199 with 30 RVs 30 RV parking spots okay so let's also throw in uh, RV parking and they have 30 of those. Okay. Now, 
what we need to figure out is what the market rate rents are. So what I would do is I would come to this website called Sparefoot, sparefoot.com, and I would enter in the zip code, which is 37160, 37160, Shelbyville, Tennessee. And I'd come there, and I'd try and figure out what the market is charging for these different products, okay? Now, if I knew what the, the current facility was charging, I would put those in the current rent field. But what really matters is the market rent. How much can this facility produce in terms of income, right? So I'd come to Shelbyville and I would look around here and I would try and get a feeling. I'd click on five by tens and I would see what everybody around me is charging. Now, as we notice, the closest facility, and I can sort here by distance. So I'd sort by distance, 18.6 miles away. This five by 10 is 55, 29 miles away. This five by 10 is 72. Obviously the closer the better, right? Storage is kind of like a gas station. People aren't gonna drive 30 miles to save, you know, five, 10 bucks a month, right? You're gonna compete with the people who are in your local area. And so as much as possible, I wanna use the people who are closest with me in determining my market rate rent. So let's just say that the market rate rent is $55 for a five by 10. I'd enter that in here. Um, and let's say that there are, you know, let's say there are 25 of these units. Let's just say there are 25 of all of these units for quick analysis purposes. 25, 25, 25. Okay, they're gonna have a little more than that, right? Um, again, I would wanna use the actual numbers that they gave me. And so now as I'm coming through, let's figure out what the rate on a 10 by 10 is. We have one that's 14 miles away, it's $82. Another one that's 14 miles away, it's $82. Um, so let's just use 82 bucks here for 10 by 10s. So 10 by 10s are 82. Now let's use 10 by 15s. We're gonna click on 10 by 15s. And it's going to show me there are no 10 by 15s. The closest one is 29 miles away, uh, 29 miles, 143, 184, 161. And so let's say our market rate rent is 140 bucks, right? Again, I'd want to dig more into this, but this is the next step is to figure out what your market rate rents are, what a fair price you could charge in the market is. Um, next up, we're going to have 10 by 20s. So I'm going to come back, type in 10 by 20s. And looks here like somebody 13 miles away is charging 120, 1, 121, uh, 121. This is the same facility, I think. Watson Storage. Looks like it's the same company, but different locations. Um, 10 by 20 here is $158. So maybe this tells me that my 10 by 15 uh, is not going to be worth it, right? You never have a you never have a scenario where a 10 by 20 is uh, is cheaper than a 10 by 15. So maybe we need to adjust this down to call it $110 and this one would be at 125. Okay. And then a 20 by 25, that's 500 square feet. Let's see what the biggest unit they have here is 10 by 30, which is 300 square feet. Um, go back. So it looks like a 15 by 25, which is about the same square feet, I think. 375, a little more, is 329, 10 by 25, 202. So let's just say the market rate rent on these uh, these 20 by 25s that they have are $350 a month, okay? 350, and now I'm gonna come back to spare foot here, and I'm actually gonna go out of this section, I'm gonna come back home, and then I'm gonna go to RV storage, and I'm gonna type in the same zip code, 37, uh, 160 and I want to figure out what people are doing now as I look at this these are all outdoor uncovered units they don't have any covered units and so let's see you can see all of them are outdoor uncovered right so I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna do outdoor uncovered units only as I'm gonna look at these looks like $45 uh, looks like this one's a little farther away $70 so I'm gonna go with $45 for the market rate rent and let's type that in Okay, boom. So what I've done here is I've gone through and I've inputted my market rate rents. I would research this a little more. I don't want to get on Google. I don't want to call local facilities. Uh, but that is pretty much how you do it. And again, know your current rents. Whatever the current rents on this are, I would get this by calling the broker, asking for a rent roll or a unit mix, uh, and getting the current rents and understanding the difference of where the market is versus where the facility actually is today. Okay. And so know your current rate rents, then scale to stabilization, okay? So what this tells me is that this facility could make $375,000 
annually. That's a little more than $30,000 a month. Now, if the facility were currently making $20,000 a month and we we're going to take it to that $30,000, $31,000 a month, we would have to get to that peak level up here is called stabilization. Okay, we want to take our facility from non-stabilized to stabilized. And that's going to take a matter of a year or multiple years, depending on how far you have to go. If you're trying to get to $30,000 and you're at like $5,000, you're going to think that's going to take multiple, multiple years in order to get there. Um, so let's say this facility was at $20,000. What we're going to do is we're going to say, is this property stabilized? No, it is not. And so in year one, we need to tell the system, where are we losing money? Are we losing money because physically our units aren't occupied, right? We have 200 units, but only 100 of them are full. If that was the case, then we would be 50% physically occupied. And then if let's say that uh, uh, the market was charging $100 and we were charging $50, then our concession rate would be at 50% as well. And so what that would show us is that we lost $187,000 to nobody being in there. And the people that were actually in there, we lost another $93,000 because those people were paying half of what they should be paying. And so if that's where we started out from, we'd want to add multiple years and we want to scale to stabilization, which up here we're telling our, facil our, our system that we'll be 95% full when we're stabilized and we'll have no concessions to market. We will be at 100% of market. If we were at 80%, then we'd type in 80 here, but we want to scale to stabilization at 100%. Okay, so year two, let's say that we take our physical occupancy up to 75% and let's say we take our concession rates up to 75% as well. And let's say in year three, we take both of these up to 90%. Let's say we go to 90 and we go to 90 again. Okay, and then let's say after that we get to our, our peak physical. We take our concession rates all the way to market and we take our physical occupancy up to 95% through advertising, through good management, through getting good reviews on the property, and through running it like it should actually be ran. And so what this shows here is how much money we're actually going to collect. Okay, so in the storage checklist, scale to stabilization, that's what that means. Next up, we need to do our other income. And so in this section right here of the other income, we can input the other kinds of income. The common other income items in storage, number one are admin fees. $20 is pretty standard. So you'd want to look at how many units you have. On average, how many people you have move in and out every single month. Uh, and then you would just want to input that in. So if we knew that on this facility that was 200 units, we had an average of 10 move-ins a month, that'd be $200 a month. Uh, coming in. So we type in $200 here and that would start, let's say we started that practice as soon as we started buying that facility. So start date, month one, year one. Next up we have late fees. The common late fee is $20. And so you'd want to look at, it's really dependent on where the facility is located, but you'd want to look at uh, what percentage of your people are normally late. It's not a good thing to collect late fees. I'd rather not collect late fees. I'd rather just get my full rent. Uh, but sometimes you're going to get late fees. And so you're going to want to implement that, let's say, in month one of year one as well. And let's say on average, you know, you collect $100 of late fees. Five people are late out of 200. That'd be pretty good. And so you're going to get $100. Now, your next thing up is tenant protection plans, okay? This is like uh, renter's insurance, but for your 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 storage tenants, Um we call it TPP in the industry, tenant protection plans. Okay, and let's. This is going to take you a while to get your consumers to bite onto it. And so let's take it. Say it takes you six months in order to get there. And uh, what this is going to do is you're going to charge the consumer however much money you want between nine and fifteen dollars, probably. That's the average range. And you're going to pay back to the underwriting company like a dollar to two dollars, depending on whatever rate they give you. Uh, that's going to be your cost, and then you're going to sell it for nine, and you're going to pay two, so your profit will be seven. Okay. And so what you could do here is you could say I'm going to collect seven dollars of profit a month. And all of these are going to go above the NOI. All of these are going to contribute to the property's value. NOI is how a property is valued. NOI divided by cap rate gives us our property value. Okay. And so what this is going to do is it's going to tell you you're going to make $1,323 a month from this whenever you get it implemented. Okay. So that's implementing your other income. Now we're going to move over to the expense side. Okay. So I'm going to click on the expenses tab and then we're going to go through and we're going to see we have a lot of stuff already filled out here. Now if they have expenses, you know, if you're going through and you're getting the package from the broker, uh, if they have expenses, then you can get their expenses from them here. Now we see here their taxes are at sixty nine twenty three. Their operating expenses uh, are at thirty five thousand dollars a month um, or thirty five thousand dollars a year, which is ridiculously low. You know, as a percentage, normally your operating expenses on storage will really never go between like thirty two thirty five percent. That's on huge properties that make a lot of money. I generally think between forty. 
uh, and 43%, somewhere in there is a pretty average and standard range to be. This right here would be, you know, $42,000 $42, divided by 251000 They're talking a 16% operating expense ratio. It's just not real, okay? Uh, so they're lying to us on that one, which is okay. That's our job to pick out the lie, and that's why we're going through this training. So next up, we want to go through, first place we want to start is our property taxes. And so we want to look up the current property tax bill and the current assessed value of this property. And this system is going to calculate your property taxes for you. Okay, and so the property taxes information on this LoopNet listing can actually be found down here. And so their, uh, their total assessment is $732,000. And the property taxes are sixty nine twenty three. And so whenever we come here to the my property stats, we can enter that in here. The current bill sixty nine twenty three, and the current assessed value of the property. Let's take a look. Is seven hundred thirty two thousand six hundred seven thirty two six hundred. So I'm gonna type that in here seven thirty two six hundred. And so whenever I click out of here at our new purchase price, it's gonna show me what our property taxes are gonna go up to. $31,000. So our property tax is going to increase that much because the government is going to know, hey, the value of this property is much higher and we're going to tax you more for that. And so whenever we look at their listing here, they're saying their total expenses are only $42,000. Well, after we buy this deal, guess what? Our property taxes alone are going to be $31,000. Okay. So this is the importance of making sure you're doing good underwriting. Okay. So after we have our property taxes done, uh, after we have all of these done, adjust your property taxes. We're going to fill out our normal operating expenses. And so inside of here, it's already going to have a lot of your normal operating expenses for you. And we can enter in how much this is going to cost us a month. I think insurance will probably be $200 a month. And that's going to come out too, as you can see over here uh, on the right hand side, $2,400 a year. Property management, if you're going to hire a property manager, that's going to be 6%. Uh, utilities, this looks like it probably doesn't have a lot of utilities. So let's call it 100 bucks a month. Pest control, let's call it $50 a month. Uh, repairs on an older facility I think you're gonna to want to budget a little bit more on a new newer facility you won't have to budget as much but I would just think that you know kind of the way that I look at it the way that I approach it on an older facility I think I'm probably gonna spend you know probably uh, 200 bucks a month on repairs could be a little more if it the older is if the property is older and no I know that it needs work it's gonna need love uh, but we'll type in $200 a month uh, and then repairs and maintenance, I kind of view those as the same thing. But I'm going to plug in $100 here for maintenance. If you're buying self-storage, you need to do things like lubricate your springs uh, when a tenant moves in and moves out. And so you'll have some money there in maintenance trying to prevent things from breaking, and then you'll have things that actually break, right? Next up, we'll have landscaping. And so as I look at this property, how much uh, grass area does it have that needs landscaping? Um, probably a decent amount. We can see that weeds are going to grow up around here. Uh, I know that there was RV parking, a field out there. And so all that grass is going to have to be cut. I think that'll probably cost you on average $200 a month, uh, probably more in the summer, less in the winter. Uh, so I'm going to type in 200 bucks a month here. Uh, again, this is just me spitballing. Like if I had this property under contract, uh, then I would be talking to lawn care providers, people who could do that for me to get an actual cost. If they already had a lawn care provider there, I just want to know from the broker or the owner, hey, how much are you paying for that? And I would input that expense here. Okay. And then accounting, you're going to pay for taxes. You may pay for bookkeeping. It may or may not be included in your property management. But let's just say that this comes out to 200 bucks a month. Uh, and then advertising, right? So one of the things that we're going to know or have to figure out is our advertising. So we're done with our normal operating expenses. We'll come back to labor here in a second. Uh, advertising. Advertising varies greatly based off of your facility, your location, and all the, 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 the jazz around that, right? If you're in a great location, you know, right on a major highway, you might not have to spend any money on advertising. If you're way out in the middle of nowhere and you can't get tenants and nobody can see your location, you may have to spend more. And so really, I think a normal range uh, is zero dollars of advertising for, for places with a great location, up to five dollars a unit a month uh, for facilities that are kind of way out in the middle of nowhere. So for a 200... Uh, for a 200 unit facility that's kind of way out in the middle, I think you should budget $1,000 a month for something that you know maybe is in between, maybe it's on the outskirts of town, has some visibility, maybe you could budget two or three dollars a month for those units. And it all depends on how full it is, right? Like I think that the broker said on this one that this has 99% occupancy. So there's no need to advertise, right? So maybe I'd throw in a little bit of money for advertising, maybe I'd throw in here, you know, a hundred bucks a month for advertising. But if this facility, just to be clear, if this facility were at 
you know, let's say going back to kind of our economic occupancy idea, if this facility were 50% full, then I want to throw in a lot of money to get this thing advertised so that I can fill that up. Because every day that a unit sits vacant is money that I'm losing, money that I could collect that I'm not collecting on, right? And so that's how I think about uh, advertising. And so next up, let's talk about labor costs. You have to figure out what kind of facility are you going to run. Again, if a facility is already being ran like this one, I'd want to ask if they have an employee, how they're running this, and if possible, continue that. But let's say that they didn't have an employee and it was up to me. Let's say the owner was doing all the work on it. Well, then I'd have to figure out, is this facility big enough that I want a full-time employee there? Does this facility need a full-time employee? Or can I have somebody who goes there once a week and checks on the facility for me? And those are all going to be questions that you as a business owner are going to have to answer. Other people can't answer that for you. People do it successfully both ways. They do it, hey, we've got full-time people on, and hey, I have somebody who goes there once a week, you know, maybe once every other week, does the work for me. And so it can go all the way down from like $1,000 a month to five or $6,000 a month, right? And we can see this facility has an office on here. It's ready for somebody to be on there, but that doesn't mean that this business, because it is so full, needs a manager to sit on there all the time. So what I'd say is I'm gonna have kind of a hybrid, maybe a part-time person, somebody working, you know, 20 hours a week on this on this property, doing all the maintenance. Maybe they have partial office hours. Maybe they can schedule an appointment with people uh, on site. And so I think that that's probably going to cost me, you know, let's call it thirty thousand dollars a year for a for a full time part time employee, somebody who's always part time there. And so I just come to uh, I'd make a labor category. We could call it on site management. Would be fine. And that's going to cost me $2,500 a month. Okay. Plug that in, and then boom. So now we can see on the right hand side over here, we have all of our expenses. Before I move on, a normal operating expense, we're going to have a couple other ones. Um, we need to talk about software, and we need to talk about payment processing. That's another checklist item here. Whenever you're doing storage, it's a great idea to get all of your customers paying by credit card on auto pay. So what you're going to want is you want payment processing, okay? And payment processors charge a fee of the revenue. So you, whenever you come here, you can do a drop down. You can do revenue percentage. And out of I've had 15 storage properties. The average percent that I've paid is 2.4 percent. Okay, so that's the number I always use in my underwriting. Some are more, some are less. I always use 2.4 Okay, it depends on what kind of credit cards your customers use, uh, how big of the volume is, all of that. But 2.4% is the amount I underwrite to. You can do higher. I know some people who are as high as three. I know other people who are as low as like two, 2.1. I use 2.4%. And what's going to happen is, is the system is now for every dollar you ever collect going to pay $2.4 in payment processing. And that's how it actually works. Okay, so I would do payment processing on there. And then next up is software, right? You need software in order to run these businesses. So you can ask what kind of software they're currently on. What I like to do is I use SiteLink or StoreEdge, depending on my store. Uh, that costs $250 a month for facilities over 100 units. I think their rates right now on facilities under 100 units are $99 a month. So I'm just gonna come in, I'm gonna plug in $250 a month. And then you're also gonna want access control software. And that's gonna cost you, what I pay is $99 a month per facility. Okay, so $99 a month right there and that's gonna be $1,200 a year. You can plug that into, that's to control and make sure that like if a tenant doesn't pay uh, their rent, your main software that you pay $250 will communicate to your access control software and it won't let them in until they make a payment, which is pretty cool software to have, right? Okay, so make sure you have your software's plugs in. Um, you can use other ones, you don't necessarily need that, uh, but that's, that's what I use. You can find some other ones that are cheaper, but don't underwrite for cheaper unless you know that you're going to use cheaper. I've used a lot of different ones. I've found SiteLink or StoreEdge are pretty much the best ones to use. Okay, And so after you've done all that, you can come, you can click on your pro forma, and this will tell you what kind of an investment this deal is. right? And so up here we have our income statement, which analyzes our income, our expenses, and our cash flows. Down here it analyzes our property value, which is based off of our NOI. And then at the bottom here, we have our financial metrics and financial returns. The most important one for me, and what I think for most people should be, is cash on cash returns, meaning for every dollar you put into this deal, uh, how much do you get back every year annually in terms of cash flow? IRR is your annual growth 
you know, like overall both cash flows and equities. And then at the very bottom, we have our cash in the deal, how much money we'd have to put in this deal. So there's a lot of cool things that this software can do. Really, everything is built around the income statement. Um, and let's go back because I know that we, we said this thing wasn't stabilized, but let's say it is stabilized. Okay, so none of this is going to be true. Now let's go look at our pro forma. What we're going to find here is, oh, let me go back. Let me get rid of these. So we come back to our pro forma here while well, it calculates. And uh, we can see that we think that this property, based off of what we've told it, is worth $3.4 million on that 7.5 cap that we used. And so we can buy it today for, I think the number was $3.3 million, right? That's how much they wanted for it? $3.3 million. So maybe it's a pretty good buy based off of these numbers, based off of our analyzing. Well, let's say it wasn't. Let's say that we wanted you know, a 10% cash on cash year one. Well, I can come to the goal seek, and what I can do here is I can type in my cash on cash of 10%. And I can do that in year one. This tells me my current rate is 8.64. Let's also say in IRR, I wanted a 15% IRR by year two, uh, which my current IRR in year two is 14.82. Or let's say that I wanted a, you know, a three equity multiple uh, over four years, meaning for every dollar I put in, I get three back uh, in terms of cash flow. And if I were to sell the property, well, I can hit seek answer. And what this software is going to do is it's going to go through and it's going to figure out how much you can pay in order to hit those goals. The cool things about all this is it changes your uh, changes your property taxes because if you pay less, then of course your property taxes are gonna be lower than that $31,000 we increased it to. Your operating capital needs are gonna be less. You don't necessarily need that much operating capital if you pay less and your loan payments are less and everything like that. Uh, and it just changes everything and analyzes. So what we can see here is if we wanna hit this 10% cash on cash goal, we could pay 3.18 million. If we wanna hit our 15% IRR goal, we pay 3.3 million. Uh, if we want our equity multiple of 3.0 in year four, we could pay 2.86 million and I can choose which of those I want, right? Now, as you go through, you're gonna to wanna to compare different options. You can do that in this module. You can try different loans against each other. And then last but not least, as you're going through and you're building out uh, and getting all your important documents, like I said, if I were to request documents from the broker, I could store all those documents in this due diligence Dropbox. So this is how you would go through and how you would, the basics of analyzing a self-storage investment. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to drop a comment below. Uh, if you haven't, get my property stats. It's an extremely powerful tool for analyzing any kind of real estate deal, not just self-storage, but any kind of deal, although it does really, really good. It's probably the best deal analyzer in the world uh, for multifamily, for self-storage, for rental houses, for anything of that nature. Sign up today. Just go to myPropertyStats.com and register now. Hope this was helpful. Talk to you soon.